The following is a presentation of The Day. Good evening, everyone. I'm Gary Ferrugia, the publisher of The Day and TheDay.com, which is live streaming tonight's debate um, between the mayor, the Daryl Justin Finizio and City Councilman Michael Passero. This is the Democratic primary debate for mayor. Um, I can see by the t-shirts and the crowds that were outside that a lot of you already have a favorite. Um, but I would ask you that you give attention to both candidates as they answer the questions. And tonight is a very important variable in the equation of what happens next in New London. Now I'd like to introduce the moderator for tonight's debate, my colleague, editorial board editor, Paul Schwinier. Paul? Thank you very much. Uh, look at this turnout. Um, democracy is alive and well in New London for sure. Um, welcome to New London High School, home of the Whalers. I'd like to... I'd like to uh, uh, thank the Board of Education for hosting this event, allowing us to uh, be here tonight for this uh, debate. Um, I'll again introduce the candidates. Uh, you're certainly welcome to applaud during that introduction, but uh, after that, I would ask you to be uh, respectful and withhold uh, applause and comments until we've concluded our debate. Uh, the format is fairly straightforward. Uh, both candidates have 25 minutes to work with over the course of the debate. When they're talking, the clock's running, either answering a question or offering rebuttal. And then we will have 90 second closings when we reach uh, the end of our debate. So our participants in the debate tonight, uh, first to your left, the petitioning candidate for the Democratic nomination New London Mayor Daryl Justin Finizio. And to your right, the nominee of the Democratic Town Committee, City Councilor Michael Passero. All right. Now we have that out of our system. Let's get on with the debate. The first question, uh, by a flip of the coin, goes to Mayor Finizio. Mayor, in your two four 2014 State of the City Address, you announced you would not seek re-election. Your state and intent was to tone down the politics and focus on policy, and it worked. You achieved several of your policy initiatives, but then in November, you announced you would run for re-election after all. What would you say to voters who suspect this was a crass political calculation from the start and you always intended to run again? Well, thank you for the question, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity to answer it. I have come to believe, over my time as mayor, that many who are involved in New London politics play the person rather than the policies. And that at that critical time in our city's history, as we were about to run out of cash and not meet a payroll, when we had the opportunity to move the National Coast Guard Museum forward and the Magnet School Construction Plan forward, that I had to take myself out of the equation or we wouldn't have made the progress that we did make, which you just pointed out. I encouraged several people to run, most notably City Councilor Efren Dominguez. I would appreciate the opportunity to support a candidate like him. But he and others who I approached came to me and told me that they didn't feel ready and that when these initiatives moved forward that they wanted me to get back in the race. And after careful consideration, I made the decision that I felt that would be in the best interest of the city to finish the job that we've started. Thank you. Uh, any comment, Mr. Passero? Thank you, Mr. Chenier. I did note that uh, 
My opponent made that announcement during the budget debate at the beginning of it, and it was April Fool's Day. And I must admit that I was skeptical at the time. But that also made me form my resolve and do my due diligence to look into running for the office. And at the time that he changed his mind, I had already made my decision and was prepared to go forward. And I did, despite his uh, change of his mind. Thank you. Anything further, Mayor, before I move to the next question? Next question then to you, Mr. Passero. <clears throat> Uh, also in 2014, city records showed you worked, excuse me, you used 300 hours of sick leave, which is equivalent to about 25 work shifts scattered throughout the year. You're a healthy man, but in your interview with me, you said they were all legitimate sick days. What would you say to voters who find that hard to believe and suspect you may have abused the system? Well, thank you, Mr. Schneer, and thank you for answering that question. I'm skeptical as to why that information was released. As my personnel records have been poured over thoroughly, and my 31-year career with the fire department has been looked through, I only wish that they pulled out some of the accommodations I earned. And I only wish they broadcast the sick leave that's a com that, that I've accumulated over 31 years. It's a tough job. You have to be 100%. I go to work when I'm not a danger to myself or the people I work with. And it's not fair to take statistics like that and try to smear a 31-year career. And that's all I have to say about that. Mr. Finizio? Well, I must say that this information came to light through the day, not through my administration. And I'm responding to it now because you asked the question. However. My opponent has said repeatedly that we need to hold the line on spending in City Hall. In the New London Fire Department, there is $1.3 million in overtime. Why do we have that overtime? Because if someone takes a sick day, we have a minimum manning requirement, and someone else has to be called in, often being paid overtime. And that overtime amounts to over a million dollars in one department, which happens to be one of our largest departments in a relatively small city. Now, I don't take issue with when Mr. Passero comes to work. I've seen Mr. Passero at a fire on Hollis Terrace, along with Rocco Basilica, a fire that ultimately claimed the life of Isabella Roth. He did a magnificent job when he was at work. But if you take a sick day and you go on Facebook, and you Facebook that you are out on your sailboat, then you are abusing the system. You are abusing the system, and you're driving up overtime. And it's the overtime throughout the city budget that is crippling us. And as that fire contract comes up on December 7th, who are you going to trust to get that contract, get that sick time, and get that overtime under control? The only chief executive of a city, myself, who's ever reduced a contractual mandate in the fire department or a fire department employee who's been abusing the system. Any further response, Mr. Passero? Yes, I'll take a couple of minutes to respond to that because that's absolutely false. I certainly would never use my sick time for any illegitimate purpose, and I certainly would not be out on the sailboat. But thank you for your, as usual, misleading and um, terrible comments, really, to be honest with you. Um, I would say this. City Hall has been closed for the better part of four years. I spent two years as council president, and every day I climbed those stairs, the place was a tomb. The office was usually locked up. I wonder, Mr. Mayor, who has been watching your time? Have you been working for this city? I think your record shows that you've been absent. Thank you. If we could... Uh Please hold our applause like requested. Thank you. Mayor Finizio, anything further? I work all day, every day. The mayor's position is a 24-7 job. Whether I am at City Hall or at my house or in the car, wherever I am, the phone is always ringing, the emails are always coming, and there are always issues to deal with. I last took a vacation out of town 
or anywhere for that matter, in February of 2008. The only vacation, substantially, that I've taken as mayor was last summer, when I stayed in town and used my vacation time to paint the fire hydrants downtown. Try to beautify the city a bit. But I work constantly. And I wouldn't make a false statement, Mr. Passero, if I didn't have the screenshots of your Facebook and my campaign will release them tonight. It was a hot, it was a hot summer ahead. night a year ago. The city council, where my opponent very rarely showed up at, we were dealing with an important issue dealing with the Lighthouse Inn. We had a developer's proposal in front of us. The council was there. We were studying this difficult issue, but we had no mayor. He was down the street painting a fire hydrant with the CAO standing over him. That's not the priorities that I felt our mayor should be doing. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, and it's to Mayor Fenizio. Uh, New London has seen substantial tax increases during your administration. In response to our read a poll, people said taxes were the number one priority. In your campaign platform, you declare, quote, the era of big tax increases in New London is over, close quote. Why should voters believe that, given your track record thus far? Voters should believe that because I'm the only candidate for mayor four years ago who didn't commit to not raise taxes. And I'm not going to commit now that taxes will never go up because that would be lying. But what I am going to tell you is my administration balanced three budgets in a row, preserved our credit rating, cut crime in half, developed a plan to move our schools forward with a $200 million investment, and enacted a fund balance replacement plan. We did all of that. But the tax increases had to come because the city had gone through years of reoccurring deficit spending and because we hadn't raised the taxes in six years. So we faced a painful, sudden correction. But the reason why the era of big tax increases is over is because for the last two years, I lobbied very hard in Hartford to secure passage of pilot reform so that the state of Connecticut will give us millions more every year in aid to compensate us for the properties in our city that are not taxable. And you don't have to take my word for it. Senate President Martin Looney, it was his bill, SB1, came to New London just last week and said at a public event that my opponent was also attending that my testimony and lobbying was critical in securing passage of that legislation that is the single biggest achievement in state legislation to ease the burden on New London taxpayers. And we will keep to a 2.5% spending cap that that legislation requires and that the city center district asked for this year. Will there be a 1%, a half a percent? Perhaps. But we will balance our budgets, we will keep moving the city forward, and we will not see any more significant sudden tax increases. Mr. Passero. Thank you. I appreciate my opponent's efforts in support of SB1. It's his duty. And I'm glad that after three years, he finally found his way to Hartford. For the first three years, as Se Senator Stillman pointed out last night, she couldn't get a hold of him. She never worked with him. During that time, I was working with Senator Stillman, Representative Hewitt, and our legislative delegation to solve the problem that was hamstringing our finances. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, was the failure to manage the Jennings School construction project. That was what was killing our cash flow. It needed to be solved. As soon as I was elected council president, I contacted Andrea Stillman. I went to work. I went to Hartford. And we began the, we began the process of recovering that money. My opponent doesn't even know about that or how that process worked. That's what was killing us. This is a false narrative. We managed our money fine. And one of the things we have to do now is we have to begin to live within our means again. He came into office. He believed we were not paying enough. And he made sure, in the course of four years, that we're paying a whole hell of a lot more. And I ask you all today, really, what are we getting for it? I want to promise you a government that's effective, efficient, and accountable. 
so that you get value for the money that you're paying. To be able to say that you balanced the budget for three years is just to say that you did your job in that one little aspect. But if you look at that, you'll find out one of those years it was balanced because the school board gave us $500,000 back. That's why it was balanced. The other piece of that is what value are we getting for that money? Look at how our city has been run. That's why I'm running, to bring you better government. Thank you. Um, before you respond, Mayor Finizio, yeah, we could just hold up the time for both our candidates where it stands so they... Uh Wow, we're very, we're very close. We're exactly, For those of you who exactly can't the same. See, very it's good. a tie, 20 minutes each. Okay, Mayor, Mayor Finizio. Well, Michael has admitted many, many times that he's not a math guy or a budget guy, and he just proved it because he's talking about one capital project reimbursement and saying I knew nothing about it. I know everything about it. And Jeff Smith, our finance director, worked very closely with the state of Connecticut to get that reimbursement. But that's not the only project that we were owed reimbursements on. There were other grants outstanding, and we've gone after those as well. But those are one-time revenues that we might get from the state, which is great. But pilot reform is millions more dollars every year. And balancing the budget is no small feat. And it's not just one aspect of doing your job. But if it is a critical aspect of doing your job, then we should ask Councillor Passero why before I became mayor, he was on city council voting for a budget that had a built-in $3.7 million deficit, most of which was bad revenue estimates. It's called fudge the numbers to get the political result you want, and it's what got New London into trouble. I didn't come into office thinking that we weren't paying enough. We were already paying enough. New London's tax burden is very high. We all know that. But if you haven't increased your tax rate in six years, if you've level funded your schools like this one to the point that they start to fall apart and we have to be intervened on by the state, if you've run out your reserves and turned your cash flow into a negative and you might not meet a payroll, that's not a matter of saying, I think we need to pay more. That's an essential, we need to pay more and we need to cut, and we did. I cut 25% of the city workforce to balance that budget, and it was no small feat. And I raised taxes, and that was no small feat. But Councillor Passero voted for those budgets and those increases too, and I'm glad he did. Because we have three years of balanced budgets, because we're replacing our reserves, that's why we have the financial ability to fix this building, fix our schools, meet our payroll, get us through storms, and keep moving the city forward. We need responsible fiscal management in New London over the next four years. I've proven I can provide that. I don't believe Mr. Passero has. Um, Mr. Passero, I'm going to get one more. Want to have one more shot at that before we move on? Oh, absolutely. I am so glad that my opponent brought that up because that is a major false narrative, another one of his. Clever argument, no factual basis. I was a freshman counselor, the 2011 budget. We were told at the end of that year that the budget would balance. It ended up having a $2.4 million hole in it. That's the, the first, when he came into office, that $2.4 million hole was what the 2012 budget was built upon. It was $2.4 million, not 3.8. The first thing my opponent did when he came into office was he just referenced it fire about 25% of the workforce at great expense to the city, both in litigation and separation agreements, which we're still paying for. That was all unbudgeted. That was all inappropriate spending. We were given, the council was given contracts after the fact that were signed that he had no legal authority to sign. I don't want to go back and relive all of this. What I want to tell you is that in the city of New London, we live within our means. We understand what the taxpayers can afford. We don't live on my opponent's dreams that we have to pay more for things that we know we can't afford. Thank you. And Mayor Finizzi, if you can maybe restrict your comment to responding to what you heard and then we can maybe move on to other topics. Mr. Passero is hoping that no one out there can read an audit, that no one can read a rating agency report, that no one can read a budget, because everything he just said is false. But it would take us about a half hour to go through it line by line. 
but the audits have been done. The budgets that he was voting on were not balanced. The budgets that I've received are. The fund balance replacement plan that I put forward that he opposed held our credit rating, and the Wall Street rating agencies affirmed that. This is not a narrative that I'm weaving. This is reality, and it was a painful reality for all of us. But we had to deal with it in order to overcome it. And since day one, when the deficit was first announced, Mike was saying, there is no deficit. This is government by ambush. Well, I'm sorry, but the deficit was real. We did solve it, and we needed to solve it to move the city forward. Mr. Pastor is trying to say, I'm creating a narrative. What he's doing is creating a narrative and hoping that people can't see the facts in black and white as they've been reported by our auditors and our rating agencies. Okay, we're going to move on to another question. You guys uh, went back and forth pretty good on that, certainly. Uh, this is to Mr. Passero. Your opponent, Mayor Finizio, suspended Police Chief Ackley for what turned out to be 10 months. He anticipated he had a case for her removal. However, an independent review concluded he had no grounds to fire her, and the chief was reinstated. Yet that same report states that the relationship between the chief and members of the rank and file is not good. If elected, how would you handle the issue of leadership in the police department? Mr. Passero. Thank you, Mr. Chenier. I believe one of the strongest skills I will bring to the office is the ability to communicate, collaborate, build consensus, and seek compromise. I've spent 20-something years working as an attorney and advisor in labor law and human resources. I can deal with that issue. What my opponent does is build divisions between people, undermine people. We need to start working together. It was council's leadership that got to the bottom of that. Another one of his misrepresentations, and this time about our police chief. One of the things I fear most under this administration is the undermining of the police department. Every city needs to have faith in its public safety mechanism. You need a mayor that supports our police department. Sure, no agency is going to be perfect. You identify the problems and you work with them. You do not systematically dismantle a police department that this community depends on. You work and you build relationships. That's what's happened here. And it's gone on for four years. Thank you. Mayor Finizio. Well, first, let me say that when I entered office, we had a biting canine unit where nine out of 10 of the dog bites affected racial and ethnic minorities. We had an officer on tape allegedly planting drugs on a suspect. We had another officer who shot an unarmed man five times, and we had an internal report saying that that was improper. Change was needed in the New London Police Department, and I'm proud of the changes we've made, including civil rights training that was supported by Chief Ackley. I have always supported Chief Ackley's stand on community policing and civil rights in law enforcement. But for years, my opponent and many of his supporters, the public safety chair of the city council, leaders of the city center district, were calling for the chief to be fired even the day itself called for the chief to retire. Eventually, over emails that I was seeing in correspondence with the chief, I came to believe that it might be possible that the allegations that had been made against her for years might have validity and that an investigation was warranted. And so I ordered one. It was the appropriate step to take. That investigation exonerated the chief and she is back to work and she has my support. But even when the day editorial board read the same emails I was reading, they opined, the chief must go. There were problems and controversies with the chief before I became mayor, and this situation does need to be resolved. But in spite of issues in leadership in the department, crime in our city has been cut in half. We haven't had a dog bite since June of 2013. The bad old days of law enforcement in New London are fading into distant memory, and that is where they need to stay. Mr. Passero, 
Could hold our applause, please. Thank you. I look forward to the day when we're at full staffing in our police department and we can begin to address the issues that my opponent has created. Until we commit to true pol com community policing again, and ladies and gentlemen, I have a different view of that police department before my opponent took office. We were working with the neighborhood associations. We were in the schools. We had a very popular program, police academy program, for both children and adults. It sold out. You couldn't get a seat. We had participation with our citizens. We were moving forward. Sure, every agency has problems. But what you do is you work, and you work towards those problems. What did my opponent do? He destroyed the upper management of that department, and he did it against the advice of his own chief as soon as he came into office. That's not helpful. The morale in that department has been terrible. You've read about it in the paper for three years, four years. I want to see more respect, not only for our police officers, but for our entire city workforce. This is a great asset for our city. Employees are not the whipping boys. Employees and girls, the employees are not the cause of the problem. It's management, the absolute lack of professional management that my opponent has brought to this, to this city. He says he wiped out 25% of the workforce. He did. He cleared places for his friends and political cronies. That has not helped us. That's not what we envisioned when we changed this charter. Mr. Mayor Finiz, you want to respond? Sure. My opponent has said repeatedly throughout his campaign that the problem is competent management and professional management. We have professional managers. Our finance team are professional managers. We have a professional financial analyst from Merrill Lynch. We have one of the best finance directors in the state who's been praised by the secretary of OPM. The city council has their own financial analyst. We have a city treasurer and we have an auditor. And when all of them and our bond council said we needed this fund balance replacement plan, Mike Passero said no. He overrode all of them while simultaneously saying I'm not a budget guy and then he pushed it to referendum and then even after the rating agencies said it was the right move, he said it was all mere sophistry. The bottom line is, is if you're going to talk about professional managers, you have to listen to the professional managers that you have and the personnel decisions that I've made have come through our personnel administrator, through department heads and those exact changes that were made in the police department were cleared with the law department, the personnel administrator at the time, and the police chief. Um, I'm going to go to the next question because I, I would like to respond to that. All right, Mr. Pastor. Thank you. I hope somebody's going to fact check some of these things uh, when they review the tape because you're completely misrepresenting my position on the bond thing. Uh, if you were, first of all, he does flatter me. I'm one member of a volunteer uh, political board, the city council, and I have one vote. And by the way, I supported the vote for the bond replacement package. I merely had them table, it was a, originally a $5 million uh, borrowing plan to borrow cash, to borrow cash and put it in our savings account. Ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't do that managing your own household. But, and I'm not sure I'm so proud of it to this day, but I made a political compromise and I agreed to $3 million of that borrowing. I accepted the logic, okay? They came back, meaning the supporters, the supporters that still supported the $5 million borrowing came back the following meeting and put another million of that on the table. So what I can tell you is I saved you a million dollars that hasn't been borrowed merely to raise cash, and it was only one million of that borrowing plan that went to referendum. Those are facts. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but that's the fact. <clears throat> Um, before I move to the next question, which go to Mayor Finizio, we'll check that time again. And they're still neck and neck at 13 minutes left. Um, I also uh, made a mistake in that I failed to point out that our timekeepers today are from the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut. I have a good applause for them. <laughs> they got a tough job, they do it well. Uh, Mayor Finizio, uh, getting back to the topic of uh, 
police and public safety, we had a little bit of a budget debate break out. Um, you have pointed to a decrease in crime in the city. Do you feel your policies have contributed to that improvement? And do you feel the public shares the same perception of lower crime? Well, first of all, yes, I do. Uh, my administration initiated better uh, patrol allocations, working with Deputy Chief Reichert, so that we, instead of having the bunker mentality of waiting for the call to come in and responding to it, we monitor when and where crimes occur and proactively send officers to those areas at that time. It suppresses crime, and it's a much more efficient way to allocate our patrol. That has had a significant impact on crime reduction, according to the Deputy Chief and according to our statistics. But I also initiated an anti-panhandling uh, initiative in downtown and downtown beautification projects and lighting projects that have made downtown a safer environment. And overall, crime in the city has been cut in half, but we've done it while retraining our officers for appropriate civil rights interactions with the public. We've done it while piloting body camera programs, and I hope the city council will end their uh, 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 stalling on this issue so that we can have body cameras for all our officers this year. And we've done it uh, with full respect for the people that we serve, and I think that's the important point. It is good to hire new officers. We're doing that. And we're also hiring more bilingual officers that we need. And we will continue hiring officers in the department. And I respect every single person who does that very difficult job. But if you're given a gun and you're given a badge and you can change people's lives forever in a diverse city with many working families, let me tell you, as long as I am mayor, I will always make sure that every law enforcement protocol that we have never, never, never violates the civil rights and the constitutional rights of every single New Londoner. Thank you. You could hold the applause, Mr. Passero. Thank you. First, quickly on the body cameras, the city council is not holding up the body cameras. The state legislature passed a comprehensive uh, public safety bill that includes uh, body cameras. They'll be rolling out, rolling out the, the uh, regulations and the protocols for the body cameras, and they'll be providing the grant money to municipalities like New London to fund the body cameras. So it's just a matter of maintaining our resources. If we have opportunities to work with the state, the other thing is we have to negotiate that with the unions. That process could be underway now, but the city council is not holding that up. And, you know, the problem with our, our policing is the lack of manpower right now. We are being proactive. We are being reactive instead of proactive. This is a problem. Our officers are forced to work overtime, and then they're condemned for the wages that they're making. It's nice that my opponent stands here and tells you we're hiring police. We haven't hired police for four years. It's like going up to the state legislature. Just a few months before the re-election campaign, all of a sudden, my opponent is up doing his job at the state legislature. I will be there from the very beginning. He's just begun hiring police. We've lost over 33 officers in the course of the last four years. When my opponent took office, we had a patrol strength of over 90 police officers. We're down below 65. So we're well overdue hiring police officers. And every year, my opponent refuses to spend the money that the city council outli out lays out for that expense. One of the problems with this administration, one of the biggest disappointments is a failure to follow the charter, a failure to respect the city council and the procedures that we have. The council sets policy. My opponent thinks he's the expert on everything. I would not meddle in the management of the police department. I would depend on the professionals that I have there running the department to do their job. That's their profession. They've done it for a career. Mayor Fenizia, please hold the applause. First of all, Councilor Passer is correct. The state does have a program. It's a reimbursement program. We would buy the cameras first and then the state would pay us back. And in the meantime, we've also ascertained a grant that the grants writer that I've been fighting to hire for four years obtained for us that could pay the debt service in the interim until we get reimbursed. And we could have the cameras now. 
Our entire financial team agrees that this is the way to go, but Councillor Passero is holding it up because he wants to be able to say in the paper, we're indebting our grandchildren. Well, it's not true. It's a campaign tactic. We should have those body cameras and we should have them now. And I would also point out that this does not need to be bargained with the union according to the union contract. And we have already successfully test piloted the program, working with the union the entire time. But I want to make another point here. Because we always talk about police and hiring police. Well, Mr. Passero has never understood that you cannot put money in for police and underfund your health insurance by $400,000 and hire the police and still have to pay the health insurance and not run a deficit. It's called math. The reason why police weren't being hired is because the budgets were cut and we needed to balance the budget. But now that there is flexibility to hire, we're hiring. But as we talk about hiring and police, which is very important, we constantly neatly neglect to talk about hiring in the Department of Public Works. Our Public Works Department had over 90 people in it and now it has 45. I have been through a lot of storms in this town. We need more people in public works and we need to start prioritizing that department because if people can't get out of their house when it snows to get to work and they lose their job or people can't get out of their house because they have a medical emergency, that is as important to public safety as it is having enough police officers on the street. We need to rebuild all our departments, not just the police department. Mr. Pastro, on that issue, please we can hold the applause. Yeah. Thank you. Public works would be in a lot better shape if we had stable professional management in that department. It's another example of rewarding a friend and political ally with an appointment, and it's been a complete disaster. In fact, it led to a death of one of our citizens. It led to fines from OSHA. The department is in complete disarray. Perhaps if three of the employees weren't unjustly fired at the moment, fighting to get their job back, they might be working. Part of the reason we're down employees is we are paying a staff of employees that were separated when my opponent first took office. The rich separation agreements that he gave out have helped to hobble our workforce. We did not envision when we changed this form of government that the professional career employees of the city would be sacrificed in a purge that's worthy of a third world nation. That's what's happened here. Uh, on the issue, let me just take another minute here, on the issue of the budget. If my opponent would show up at a council meeting when we're deliberating the budget, if he would allow his finance department to give us the information we need, we are seven volunteers putting together a budget. We merely state policy. Our policy has been consistently we passed an ordinance. We need at least 80 police. It's his duty and his obligation to work with us to make sure we fund that policy, including health insurance and all the other costs. He has had no sincere, and it's obvious from four years of experience, he has had no sincerity in supporting our police department. He has systematically dismantled it. It's dangerous. We need to support our police department. If you don't like what it was, then you work with the agency and you make the agency responsible to our community. First, we need to restaff it. Then we need to concentrate on a real, enforcing a real philosophy of community policing. Our police officers should be our friends and our partners, and especially in a small community like this. They should not be vilified the way my opponent has vilified them for four years. Well, please, uh, you can please hold the applause. Let's be fair to both candidates. Uh, Mayor Finizio, uh, your opponent raised a, a couple of points there. The problems in the Public Works Department and he feels you've contributed to uh, the morale problem in the police department. I want to give you certainly a chance to respond uh, to his uh, allegations. First of all, when I appointed Director Hanser, he was not a friend of mine. He applied when I asked for applications, and I was impressed with his bureaucratic organizational skill. He walked into a department that was bleeding out a deficit of over $900,000 and balanced that budget. We did balance the budget, based on savings from the school department, but we also came in under budget in the public works department. Even while battling, 
the worst hurricane that we've had in over a half century, the worst blizzard in over a hundred years, and then the worst winter on record. We came through it and we balanced our budget. Now that was, in my opinion, competent management. But Mr. Passero again hopes that like him, you can't add. Because this is how it works. I go to the city council and I say I have a new police contract. I've negotiated it with them. Bring it to them in executive session, show it to them. Say, look, there's added costs in this. Because if you approve this contract, there's a financial impact. It will require a line item transfer of $425,000 to satisfy the contract. The question is raised, well, is there enough money in that account that we're going to transfer the money out of? A very fair question. And Mr. Passero says, well, I'd like a two-week delay just to know that there's enough money in the account. So we go check the account. It has over $600,000 in it. And then Mr. Passero says, I'm not approving the line item transfer. We're not hiring cops. Uh, you have plenty of money in the budget. And on and on and on. It's political rhetoric. It's not mathematics. I have balanced the city budget three times in a row after the city had reoccurring deficits. I did that because I do understand the mathematics of the budget, and Councillor Passero, time and time again, has proved that he does not. Mr. Passero, thank you. Before we move to the next question, I'll give you a chance to respond. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, after years of frustration, setting aside money in the police department budget specifically to increase our patrol staff and never seeing that happen, last year we put $500,000 into what we called inappropriately a contingency fund to hire police officers. That was the money that my opponent wanted to spend on what he called the increased cost of the police contract. What I sought was information on where else in that budget we could find that extra money and not go into the account that we put aside to finally start hiring police officers. I don't want to waste too much more of my time on this, but I will tell you this. When we close the fiscal year, that $500,000 to increase patrol staff was still in that line item account. So I could track it from the beginning of the year to the end. It was never spent on what the council set the policy to spend it on. Once again, it's a disrespect for the process. My opponent, if he disagrees with the policy that the city council sets, he simply does what he wants. It doesn't work. He proves that old adage. Lying and deceit tears at the fabric, the very fabric and integrity of government. That's what I've dealt with for four years. I promise you, not talking about transparency, I promise you truly open government I will be in that council chamber every time the city council meets. If we're working on a budget, I will work with them. I will make sure my finance department works with the council, gives them the information that they need. They are your elected officials. They set the policy for you. As mayor, I have to honor that, whether I agree with it or disagree with it. I will win some arguments. I will lose some arguments. But I will respect the charter. I will respect the process. I will not continue to pull us down the way we've been pulled down for four years. If we could hold the applause, please. Uh, I got to give Mayor Finizio a chance to respond some, uh, if he wants to. Sure. Mike talks about what he's been dealing with for four years. Let me tell you what I've been dealing with for four years. We put money in this account to hire police. Go hire them. OK, sounds good. How's the rest of the budget doing? Oh wait, we have a deficit in the fire department. I wonder why. Maybe it's because some city employees are treating the city treasury like it's their own private bank account. When we have $1.3 million in overtime and we're still running a deficit in that department. Now we have to cover that deficit. We have to cover any revenue shortfalls that we get. And if I run out and spend every penny that the council wants spent on whatever the council wants it spent on, and I don't cover the deficits elsewhere in the budget, then we run a city deficit. We eat into our reserves, we run out our cash, and we fail to meet payroll. I have been making this argument, the financial team has been making this argument, every financial expert we have has been making this argument for four years, but Michael keeps saying, 
I just want you to do what I tell you to do and make the math work somehow. Well, that's not how government budgeting works. And if you want to talk about transparency, this administration is one of the only administrations in the entire state that has answered every single FOI request we have received, that has put our check register online, that has agreed to any audit that anyone wants to perform or any investigation of any financial record that anyone asks for. The numbers are there, they've been looked over, and they've been verified. We keep balancing the budget. Mike keeps wanting us to run a deficit, and we simply can't afford to do that. I'm going to let you, uh, if we could hold the applause, please. Uh, this might be a good time to uh, hold up um, the time. So six minutes and six minutes. And uh, I tell you, uh, by the power vested in me as moderator, why don't we add some time in? Because this is a good debate. Um, why don't we add five minutes each? We'll give them 11 minutes each. I hope the candidates don't mind. We get a little extra time. We get a lot of questions to get to. So you'll have 11 minutes each. Because you guys are going along without me asking many questions. So you got a lot of time for yourselves. Paul, I'd like to respond. Uh, OK, the next question is yours, but go ahead. My opponent likes to make jabs at the fire department, um, obviously, because I've been there. The problem with overtime is he doesn't fill positions. He's hired one firefighter during his term. And actually, he hired him and fired him twice. We invested a lot of money at the beginning of his term. We had a number of new employees. We had just hired 10. And he had a hiring before that young people starting out on their career with young families. And one of his first callous political poise was to give half of the department 30 firefighters pink slips with absolutely no compassion whatsoever with what that meant and what he was putting those families through. I could tell them, look, he can't do that. We can't operate with half the fire department. But that doesn't reassure a family that, that needs security in their employment. Well, what that did is that drove 10 of them away. Immediately after they're out of the woods there and still had their jobs, they weren't going to take a chance on New London anymore. So we, at $100,000 a piece, we trained those firefighters. And now they're now working for places like Branford and West Hartford, and you name it, all over this state. We did the same thing for police officers, too, by the way. A lot of young, bright officers with great careers left early in this administration and are still leaving for careers in a more stable government. We've never had that in New London, and we shouldn't have that going forward. Uh, yeah, Mayor Finizio, Justin, you did raise the issue of overtime in uh, the fire department. Um, I looked up the numbers, the last three fiscal years, the overtime budget went over by $842,000. That's even after a, a quarter million dollar increase in overtime to try to cover it. But, it, but isn't, you're the mayor, isn't that ultimately uh, your issue? And you know, why can't you get a handle on that in the fire department? Well, I'll tell you why. And first, let me tell you that Mike's wrong. He said earlier in the debate that I came into office, the first thing I did was cut 25 percent. It's not true. The first thing I did when I came into office is I said, here's what your budget really costs. There's a 20 percent tax increase. Nobody wanted it. I didn't want it. It was the most uncomfortable thing I've ever done to walk out there and tell a whole town, oh my god, your taxes have to go up that much. But because of the deficits we were running, including deficits in the fire department that sometimes exceeded a million dollars, we had to get that under control. And the first thing I did was honor the cost, the honest cost, of every single union contract in this city. The council, under his leadership, not only as council president, but as finance chair, cut that back. He said, can you live with it? I said, yeah, I can live with it, meaning I'll make it work. He thought you can live with it without any cuts. No, they're going to be cuts. The cost of your government was the budget I presented to you, and Fire Chief Ron Samuel agreed with that budget. And when it got cut, Fire Chief Ron Samuel is the one who said it would take this many people being laid off to balance the fire department budget. 
So we went through a tough union negotiation, but not a single New London firefighter ever walked out of that firehouse being laid off. At the end of it, we got minimum manning down for the first time ever in city history. We got some other small concessions, and we shrunk the deficit in that department. But you asked the question, well, you're the mayor. Can't you go further? Can't you get it under control? Yes, I can. The State Labor Board has already said that our minimum manning could be at 14. We're currently at 16. We used to be at 18. But the fire department contract is closed until December 7th. So this year, I had to accurately fund what those contractual minimum manning requirements were going to cost. I had to fund all the sick time use and what it was going to cost in order to balance the budget again. But in December, when that contract comes open, I'm going to re-enter negotiations with the fire union. I'm going to do it in good faith. I'm going to be firm, but I'm going to be fair. The last time we went through this, they got a defined benefit pension, first in the country to go from a 401 to a defined benefit pension. And they got a better state health plan, and nobody got laid off. I hope we have just as successful a result, but one way or the other, the taxpayers of the city of New London need to know, I am going to get the overtime in the fire department under control because I have a proven track record of reducing the contractual obligations that drive up overtime in that department. Mr. Passer. Thank you. A couple of facts that are wrong. Number one, the Labor Board has, ne have, has never found that we can operate the fire department in the city of London with 14 men. And in fact, it's an impossibility. However, I want to discuss another inaccuracy in my opponent's statements there. That first budget, he walked up to me after we passed it. He shook my hand, and he's the one that said, I can live with it. And I took him at his word. And I believe he was being honest to me at the time. What he didn't know, and what I didn't know, but he learned a lot sooner than me, was that his finance director had double budgeted $500,000 in ECS funding. I didn't find that out until well after the layoffs that I found off, that I found out from a day reporter. Not even the respect to call me first, or even approach the council and say, there's a problem with the budget we just passed. There's a $500,000 mistake. That's the type of deceit and deception that causes bad government, that causes misunderstandings. The council really and truly and I was invested in the success of my opponents. He was the first elected mayor in a generation. I strongly was behind the charter change. All we needed was a little cooperation, respect for the charter that we changed, and respect for the council processes. Mayor Finizio, before I move on. Well, Mike makes kind of a second grade point that I went up and shook his hand and this and that. That's not how it happened. I was sitting in the chair that the finance director usually sits in next to the seat that he sits in now. Adam Spricacci actually asked the question, can you live with this? Mike looked over at me. I said, yeah. And then they rushed through the budget and then they blamed it all on me. And I did reach out to you, Mike. I called you. I remembered I was standing in front of the day building actually on my cell phone telling you that Ron Samuel and Bernadette Welsh are telling me this is the number of people it's going to take to lay off to balance the fire department. You told me you're being lied to. You're being lied to. You're being bamboozled, blah, blah, blah. No, I wasn't. Our government had a huge deficit. We had to correct it. If we weren't going to pay for it with taxes, we had to pay for it with cuts. The taxes were painful. The cuts were painful. But here's the bottom line. We did it. We balanced the budget. We held our credit rating. And now, with pilot reform being passed and the increases that we've had to absorb, taxes have stabilized. Our budget has stabilized. We're rehiring. We're moving forward. And crime is down. We have a $200 million investment plan for our schools. We are far better off, far better off, than we were four years ago. And that's the bottom line that Mr. Passero wants you to not think about. All right, I've got to move on if we're going to get to some more questions. Um, this is a debate in the Democratic primary to choose the candidate of the Democratic Party. Mr. Passero, if you fail to win the primary on September 16th, can you pledge tonight that you will support the nominee and not continue on in the general election? Why or why not? I have not made that decision. However, I have made contingencies because I've pledged to all the people in this city that I'm in this to the end. I've
I fully, Please. I fully expect to win on September 16th. And if I don't, we will reassess. But if you remember, four years ago, the Democratic Party's nominee lost the primary to my opponent. And he had not made any provisions for continuing beyond that. He was roundly criticized for that. My campaign has made a, made a decision back at the deadline on October 5th to cover that base. And we will make that decision on September 17th, if it's necessary. I don't believe we'll ever get to that point. Mayor Fenizio, um, your response before I give you the same opportunity. To please hold applause, please. I am and always have been a political progressive. And I believe in my heart that the best way for progressives to be effective is to work within the Democratic Party. I am a Democrat. I will support the Democratic nominee and the Democratic ticket because that's what's going to move this city forward. And if my former opponent, now a very big supporter of yours, was criticized for not making contingencies to split the party, most of those criticisms probably came from very conservative Democrats in name only and Republicans who want to come into the Democratic primary to see to it that basically a conservative Republican candidate gets elected. And if he can't, maybe there's another route. I'm not a Democrat to get elected in New London. I'm a Democrat because I believe in progressive democratic values and I believe that those values are the values that are shared by the majority of the people who are going to be voting on September 16th. So while my opponent is very confident of victory, I would say I don't know the result. But Mike, you might be in for a surprise. Just, just to clarify, Mayor Finizio, so are you taking that pledge that if your opponent wins, you will not launch a, uh, can't, you will not continue in the general election, you will support him? Correct. Okay. I'm a Democrat, and let me tell you why you need to be a Democrat. I have a very close, close relationship with the governor of our state, who's a Democrat, who I supported for re-election. I've worked with the Democratic leadership in the State House. They are Democrats. I've worked with our Democratic congressional delegation on the Coast Guard Museum project. I will continue to work within the Democratic Party, win or lose this election, because I believe it is the best way for New London to move forward and the best way for the whole country to move forward in the end. I'm proud to be a Democrat. Okay, for our next question, if we could calculate the time, the timekeepers. Paul, I did not get a chance to respond. Okay, let me just, uh, all right, seven minutes, Mr. Passero, a little under six minutes for Mayor Finizio. Uh, on the question of the uh, general election? Yes. Okay. I want to welcome my opponent to the Democratic Party, but he is. He was a Republican in Rhode Island when it was convenient to be a Republican. It's more convenient to be a Democrat in New London, so he's a Democrat. Read the Brown Spectator article where he's bashing public sector unions. That was a mere 10 years ago. So it's good to hear that he's come around, and it's great to hear what a progressive he is. But in New London, we are whalers first. And we are a strong democratic community, and we don't need to be lectured by a former Republican from Rhode Island. Please, um, you're breaking the rules here. Please withhold the applause, both sides. Briefly, Mayor Finizio, so we can continue on. I was a Republican in Rhode Island because I stood with the Chafees. Link Chafee is now a Democrat running for President of the United States. I will tell you, I have always been a progressive. And to say that it's convenient to run as a Republican in Rhode Island, in 2006, when I was elected to the Wesley Town Council, because of master lever voting, I started off at a 700 vote deficit, and I was the only non-incumbent Republican elected that year in the entire state. So it wasn't convenient then. And I didn't switch when I moved to New London. I switched when I lived in Waterford because I wanted to support President Obama in his health care push. And I was very angry in 2009 at the formation of the Tea Party movement and the fact that the Republican Party had drifted so far to lunacy and now they're considering a man like Donald Trump as their nominee. It's become a joke. 
and I knew that as a progressive, the only place to be was the Democratic Party. That's where I am, and that's where I'm going to stay. All right, the next question goes to Mayor Finizio. Uh, vacancy rates remain high in the downtown. Fort Trumbull is still largely undeveloped. What would your administration do in a second term to get development moving forward in the city of New London? I believe the single largest economic development achievement in recent New London history is the attraction of the National Coast Guard Museum project to the city of New London. Now this project was around for a while, but it was stalled until I went to Washington, D.C. and met with the Commandant of the Coast Guard and negotiated, please, please. and negotiated bringing the museum here. Admiral Papp said so on the Eagle last week. So apparently you weren't there. But that development project in downtown is going to be the single biggest boost to our city center that we've ever seen. Connected to the other historic sites around our port, it could be a main tourist attraction and economic driver for the entire port of New London. We also have development projects moving forward at Fort Trumbull and on Parcel J, and hopefully they will break ground this year. I'm very confident that in the years to come, our grand list will grow and economic development will continue to move forward as we reform our schools and open the doors in the National Coast Guard Museum. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pastor, the issue of economic development in New London. Thank you. I agree. The National Coast Guard Museum is one of the most exciting things that's happened and one of the few things that's happened over the last four years. And it will help New London, but it will not be the silver bullet. I do not want that jewel hanging on a corpse. We need to get to work. And that's what whalers do. They roll up their sleeves and they get to work. The secret to economic development, number one, is to elect a mayor that is going to represent the city positively in the media and the national media. As recently as May, he's in the Boston Globe running down our development corporation, effectively running down our city. We do not need a mayor who's yelling that the sky is falling. Because first of all, the sky wasn't falling. We are whalers. We persevere and we work through our problems. We believed when we changed the charter that by electing a mayor, one of us, that was going to be the spark that finally set us going to achieve our potential. It depended on that mayor appointing a professional city government to run the government so the mayor could effectuate the policies of the city council. None of that is happening. It doesn't mean I've lost faith in this former government. It means that we're going to do it again and we're going to do it right. And that's where the secret to our economic development lies, in getting this new experiment in an elected mayor right. Mayor Fenizio. Mike Pastro says we need to be whalers first. I agree. So why are we going to make our most important development decisions in the boardroom of a private corporation that can meet in secret where half its members don't even live in town? I'm sorry, but I still believe that we created the office Please. of mayor so that the people of New London could decide what our development future would be. And I still believe that we would be better off if we were deciding those decisions through our elected leaders. But I've pledged to work with the NLDC, now RCDA, on the properties that they still own. But I do not believe that it should be expanded. My opponent believes that NLDC's role should be expanded throughout the city. And the president of RCDA said in the newspaper that she looked forward to expanding their role into all the neighborhoods of New London so that they could assist in the, quote, redevelopment of New London. Redevelopment of New London. Well, I'm sorry, but we've heard those words before. And it didn't end well for the people of New London. I believe the people of New London should be responsible for their own land, for their own destiny, for their own future, through their own elected leaders. That's what this office was created for. For whalers first, not for out-of-town corporate interests that want to steer our development that might benefit them, but might not help the people in the other neighborhoods of New London that they now look to expand their role into. Mr. Pastor, do you want to address clever. the issue of the development agency in your That's views? another clever argument that has absolutely no factual basis. The Development Corporation is not a private group that meets in secret. 
and he should know this, but of course he's never, to my knowledge, I've seen him at one meeting. I've gone to almost every meeting in the six years that I've served you, because that is an important agency in this city. It is a quasi-public agency. It meets all FOI regulations, and any citizen in this city can join that corporation and be a member. It is not predominantly out-of-town people. It is the stakeholders. It is the people that are going to get development moving in this city. And we had it going. You'll remember that the, heel of, the, the, the wound of Kilo was healing. The day paper had a forum up in his office, got both sides together. We commissioned the Yale Urban Design Workshop to come to town. They reaffirmed the, MD, the MDP. The MDP, which was supported by the citizens. And most importantly, let me tell you, most importantly, the city leaders still have final say. Everything that the corporation does has to go to the city council. The city council is still the ultimate determiner. You elect the city council. The development corporation is your tool to help get things done. We've lost four years because he has spent four years dragging them down, making them just the boogeyman, and they are not. They're there to help us. We need to empower them. Um, last word, Mayor Finizio, on this issue. When NLDC says they're coming to a neighborhood near you and they're just here to help, watch out. All right, thank you. Please. Be respectful of both candidates. It, it, it doesn't look well uh, with those kind of outbursts. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it's, the question is to Mr. Passero. Um, you've, you've noted your experience in labor relations. Oh, yes, if we could see the time. And uh, Mayor Finizio is about two minutes. Um, you referred to your experience in labor relations. Your, a labor attorney in addition to a career firefighter, a union member. Um, the positive side of that is your experience, but taxpayers might fear the negative side of that is, will you be able to make the tough decisions with labor to control costs for the benefits of the taxpayer? Absolutely. I will draw on that experience that I've had negotiating labor contracts for over 20 years. The difference will be, I'll be changing sides of the table. I'll be putting that experience to work for the taxpayers in New London. But my philosophy in labor relations and what I've, what I've found out over the years is win-win is the only way it works. Both sides have interests. And both sides have to come together to satisfy each other's interests. So yes, I am very, very confident that number one, we will have better labor relations in this city with somebody who's experienced, understands the process, and my opponent does not, especially when it comes to arbitration. An arbitration panel, in fact, went out of the way, I've never saw this in my life, but referred to our mayor's ignorance of the law in reinstating an unjustly fired police officer. Those, those type of things will not happen. I will put my, my experience in labor relations to work for the taxpayers of New London, and I will appreciate the value of our workforce. There's no conflict there. All right, thank you. Your response, Mayor Finizio? I have negotiated contracts with every union now. I brought down the costs in every single one, and I balanced the budget three times. Mike Passifro, while serving on the council, has voted on and spoken on issues relating to his own employment and his own department. If I am mayor for another term, I will continue to work in good faith with the unions to represent the workers, but also to be fair to the taxpayers, and I have a proven track record of doing that. All right, thank you. Um, check the time. I'm sure we're getting down to the uh, last couple of minutes. Um, uh, mayor Finuzio, next question to you. Uh, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment in your term as mayor? And what was your biggest mistake and what did you learn from it? My biggest accomplishment is the passage of the Magnet School Bonding Ordinance. And the night it passed, Mike Passero offered several amendments. One was to separate the middle school from this building. 
which would have sunk the whole magnet plan because both have to be done in concert. Another said that we'll only build it if the debt service line in the city budget never goes up, which means we'll do it as long as we never have to pay for it. But we pushed, we pushed hard all night long, and in the end, it passed, and yes, at the final bell, Mike voted for it as well, and I thank him for that, because it's the single greatest thing that's happened in this city in a long time, and it's going to transform New London for the better. As to the biggest mistake, well, I know now, even if you've been boxing and you have a bunch of bruises on your head, whatever the heck you do, for the love of God, do not wear a hat to a public meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you can respond to that, and I'll give you the same opportunity after response. I need my time. I'm, okay. I need my time. What's the time uh, for Mr. Passero? Two minutes. Thank you. First of all, I strongly supported the Magnet School project. The way it was presented to council, it had three problems. Number one, I could not get a debt service projection out of the finance department. They expected me to go into a blind. I just wanted the information. I have since found out, and, I w and the, the people in this city should have known, that that project, I don't believe it would waver my commitment, but that project is going to double our debt service over the course of the next 10 years. So we're going to have to redouble our effort to build our economic base. But most importantly, separating the two projects. We are not running the two projects together. We are moving forward with rebuilding this campus here first. The middle school project comes later. There's a delay. I asked our consultant at that meeting if this and I was sure it was going to be referendum. If this appropriation ordinance is referendum, what does that do with meeting the deadline at the State School of Construction to approve the grants? And she said it would probably not meet the deadline. And it did not. You'll remember all of the, uh, we, we were refused to be put on the list. We had to wait until just the, the end of the legislative session to be assured that the state was going to let us go ahead with this project. I was worried about that because I've been on the School Building and Maintenance Committee managing these school construction projects for four years. My opponent showed up once for 15 minutes. He doesn't understand the process. We needed to get on that priority list. I'm risk adverse. I wanted to be sure we were on that priority list and I was sure that this community was not going to referendum the part, the single appropriation ordinance for this high school because we have, it might be before his time, we have been trying to find a way to rebuild this high school now since I was elected six years ago. And I saw this as the greatest opportunity. In favor of the whole project, I just had a more practical way to go about it. I didn't want to sweat out all year seeing if the legislature was going to pass an exception to let us on that priority list. That's what we had to wait for. That's all I was trying to avoid. And with that, Mr. Pastor, your time has run out. Uh, how much time for Mayor Finizio before he goes to about a half a minute? Um, I'll try to get something quick here, to be fair. Um, one of our reader questions concerned uh, the number of cars in the city that are <clears throat> registered out of state and why the city has not been more aggressive in identifying them and taxing them um, as New Haven has and Waterbury has. If you could, if you could use your 30 seconds address why that hasn't been your policy during your term. I think that's the Jeff Suntup question. And let me tell you what I've always told him. If the city council approves and funds a program to go after those individuals that aren't paying taxes, we will. But back to the point about Mike. Mike said he's risk averse. When the golden opportunity sits before you, you have to go for it. You need a mayor who's willing to go for it. Yeah, it was going to be referendum. It went to referendum. We campaigned for it, and we passed it two to one. And let me tell you right now, you could give Mike at any council meeting the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. If one page of the index was missing, he'd say he needs more information. And they'd have five more meetings about it. There's doing your due diligence, and then there's undue delay. New London can't delay anymore. He said it himself. We were looking for years for the solution. Well, when the solution presents itself, you have to take it because I've taken the initiative, because I've pushed it over the line, that's why this building is going to be fixed, and that's why our school system is going to be reformed. With that, we're going to move to the uh, final comments of our candidates. Uh, by a flip of the coin, Mayor Finizio, you go first. Uh, you have 90 seconds. 
Well, thank you, Paul, and I thank the day for this opportunity in the League of Women Voters. I also thank my opponent. Though we disagree mightily, it takes a lot to run for public office, and I respect him. But I will say this. If the theme of my administration and the theme of my reelection can be summed up in three words, they are everyone matters equally. Everyone did not always matter equally in New London. When we had problems with law enforcement, when we were level funding our schools five years in a row for the first time in our state, we weren't on the right path. Some people might have been okay, but many, many, many of our citizens were being left behind. I want New London to improve, and it has. I believe we're much better off now than we were four years ago, but all of us are better off, not just those who are connected, not just those who are privileged, but every neighborhood, every person, every child who deserves an equal opportunity in life that they are now going to get when we create the best school district in the state of Connecticut. I believe that everyone matters equally, and whatever decisions I make are guided by that, and if you reelect me, they always will be. Thank you for listening tonight, and thank you for your consideration in the coming election. Thank you. And Mr. Passero, your opportunity. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for hosting this tonight. And thank you all for caring enough about this city to come out and share this time with us. It was great to stand in the lobby and meet you and see so many familiar faces and friends. Those of you that know me, those of you that are getting to know me, one thing you understand is I wear my love for this city on my sleeve. Personal ambition does not drive me to seek this office. What motivates me is the ambition I share with all of you to see this city succeed. But it's also gratitude. I feel an obligation to give back. I've had a great life. This city has given me a lot. And this is a good time for me in my life to do this. I love going to the fire department still, but after 31 years, I'm ready to give somebody else that opportunity, and I hope it's a whaler. When I started this campaign 10 months ago, I described it as the longest job interview of my life. And let me tell you, we're ready to get that message out. We're getting that message out. I want to throw open the doors of City Hall. They've been closed for too long. All of you that have been sidelines, you feel like you've been disenfranchised. All the talent that's on the sidelines, I want to get you back into this game. This, the future of the city is all of you. It's not rhetoric. It's our city. It's our future. It's our time. Thank you, Mr. Passero. And now you can applaud for both our candidates. And with that, we're signing off for tonight. Thank you.